Hello, Homo sapiens sapiens. My name is Said Badwan. And by now, you may be probably wondering why is this weird guy who just called me Homo sapiens sapiens wearing these weird bracelets with blink lights. And don't worry, we'll get to that. But to begin with this talk, I want you to take a moment and ask yourself, how do you imagine the future will be? Take your time. It is humanity's future you're picturing, and I think it's quite important to think about it seriously, because the future, it's only what we, people create, and we can't create what we can't imagine. When I ask this question, typical responses are in the sorts of service robots taking orders at the restaurant, or checking us in in the hotel. Thanks, Inmob. That will be all for today. You're welcome, Zaid. Always at your service. You name it. Cloning, flying cars, and alternate realities like in the movie Matrix. We can conclude then that the future most of us humans imagine, it's actually just our past. And it's already on its way for mass adoption. I mean, you just saw my robotic friend. And I'm quite sure we all remember our vintage friend from the 90s. Dolly. The clone ship. Nowadays, we have the technology for robots to 3D print houses on the moon. I actually worked in the lab that created this technology when I was doing research in the United States. Our company in Mexico is 3D printing robotic prosthetics used by cyber humans that control them with their minds through their brain waves. Humanity is also creating bioengineered babies more intelligent and resistant to diseases, alphas, for the readers of A Brave New World, from Aldous Huxley. By now, you surely have realized this conference is not your typical TED Talk, since it's actually being given by a robot. But I mean, I'm not talking about the physical entity that just replaced me on your screen, since robots don't necessarily need humanoid bodies. The script for this talk was actually in part written by a robot. These words are the insights of an algorithm trained by reading the speeches I've given in the past, writing something that sounds exactly as what I will say, while I haven't said it yet. In this virtual world, my robotic body is known as an avatar, and it can do anything you can think of, and also control my surroundings, like taking a ride on the flying cars above me. So, what do you think of my new body? I won't lie, it feels weird to be a human again. Because yet, another robot is using artificial intelligence to track my facial expressions, compute them, and superimposing them in a digital version of myself. And it's all happening in real time. My motion capture suit is digitalizing my body and hands. This is why I have inertial sensors all over my body, recollecting data and simulating my movements on my virtual skeleton. This way, I can inhabit infinite bodies on infinite worlds. There's multiple ways to introduce myself in the virtual world, such as using 3D scanning, where with a mixture of cameras, pattern recognition, and the speed of lasers bouncing on the desired person or object, we can create that 3D mesh and add the texture of my skin on top. That's actually the same technology that we use to scan our patients to craft personalized prosthetics with perfect fit and matching the size of other limbs. We work over their virtual bodies, and then we bring them back to the physical world by using 3D printing. Anyway, right now I'm more interested in blending both virtual and physical worlds in one, and the possibilities this presents. Because right now, we're breaking the barrier that separated bits and atoms, turning them in a blurred concept for humans tradable from one to other, a concept I like to call bitons. And while all of this may seem just like entertaining visuals, like the ones you see in movies or video games, this technology actually has broader implications. Because now, you see me moving my lips, but what you're listening to isn't my voice but another robot, an AI trained by listening to me, speaking just like I do. If I go virtual, 
Thief robot will let someone else possess my virtual body and speak on my behalf using my voice and body. Or that someone could be just another robot writing his own script. We can no longer know. Not quite convenient if you have a jealous partner or a political career. This will become more and more relevant as interaction between the girls becomes easier and easier till the point we won't bother trying to guess if we're in a physical or virtual environment. After talking so much about our past, I think it's quite clear that technology advances fast. We were born in a world without internet access, and now we have all of this to give us an idea of what can we expect next. So now that we know where we are, it's finally time to start imagining how the future will actually look like, since what we imagine is what we do. Which means, to state we could live forever, all we need in the future will be the ability to truly copy an entire brain and storing it in a robotic body or a virtual world. And there's plenty of promising research on the topic happening nowadays. This transition is maybe just the next step of the history of 7 million years of human evolution. Contrary to popular belief, human evolution hasn't been stagnated, and it's actually faster and faster. In only the last 100 years, genetic changes in humans around the world have expressed characteristics such as Iberians with faster metabolism, which produces enough heat to prevent frostbite, or people from the Vahau tribe that can dive underwater for over 12 minutes when a healthy, average human can hold its breath for only a minute. But anyway, old-fashioned evolution seems far too slow compared to the newly available genetic engineering. That could express these characteristics and others all at once, and even faster. We could even skip the generational button all along, since we can just bio-augment already existing humans. Even as of today, amputees are considered to have an unfair advantage at the Olympics, because it's easier for them to run long distances using their prosthesis. Instead of being considered disabled, in competition, they have advantages over able people, which in this case, a better semantic will be to call them super able. So the next step of evolution is a paradigm change. From changing our surroundings to start changing ourselves. This will be the link from the Homo sapiens sapiens to the Robo sapiens. But this won't simply stop on getting stronger arms or eyes with super zooms enabled to see in the dark. In the future, more memory or even faster thinking could become similar to purchasing a laptop with a faster processor and expanded RAM memory today. This future will carry its own problems on its own. Inequality could increase as exponentially as technology does, increasing more and more the gap of income in populations, since better augmented humans could have access to better jobs, which will give them access to better upgrades over time, and so and so on. This will also work the other way around for the ones not as privileged. Still, not by augmenting will not seem like a choice in a social world surrounded by super able robo sapiens. The old genetic wars of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens told us that. And in the same fashion, we can understand that robots are not other species that are going to replace us. But the next step in the evolution of our own species, starting with a cyber link until full robotic and virtual preservation of our species, what's even more complicated and even an ethical dilemma, the same will necessarily apply 
to our children. Will the parents love? Let them lose the chance to get them the better opportunities they could, like being born smarter or resistant to diseases. And if we will do what's best for them, and if we were willing to accept evolution, how different would it be to have a robotic son? Maybe, first of all, on our total lack of capacity to love them. Biology seems to have a sad explanation for the love we feel for our sons. As an instinctive need for transcendence, a desire that's hardwired in our physiology to keep our genes alive in the planet before we die, and protecting those genes in the form of a son, even with our own life, so they can grow, and this way, impose on them the responsibility of perpetuating the cycle by reproducing again. For biology, love is not the reason, but selfishness. That's why, out of this idea of love, I would prefer to break my personal cycle and transcend by accepting and being part of the transition to the age of the Robo Sapiens. Since maybe humanity's new sons, with their superior brains, with ever growing computing capacity, and without the biological limitations, will finally succeed to answer the questions that have fascinated and plagued us since the beginning of humanity. What is our purpose? What is our origin? And who are we? Humans, robots, or maybe just stardust all the same. Just before I say goodbye, I just want to point out that I can just take credit for this talk, since it's a result of the collective work of me and all the robots that collaborated in creating it. Also, its success will still depend on more robots, now the ones from Google, which will be watching it and rating this talk just to decide if they should recommend it to more homo sapiens. So if you think that will be a good idea, you can tell those robots directly by clicking the like button on this talk. Thank you very much for listening to our talk.